for our own success and our own well-being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us what is translated as, O believers, be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah as He deserves. Have taqwa of Allah as is His right upon you. And do not die except in a state of submission, in a state of Islam, in a state of worship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live upon taqwa and Islam and iman to die upon it as well. Allahumma ameen. One time in a classroom setting, a teacher asked, what is a good ending? What does it mean to have a good ending? And of course, without more context, the responses were diverse. A good ending in what sense? A good ending for this class, for this khutbah, for your program, for your diet, for your habits, for your life. What is a good ending? Oftentimes when you explore the writing of fiction and the documentation of history, you find that many people are looking for a certain type of feeling at the end of a novel or a movie or TV show. They're looking for people living happily ever after. They're looking for the main character to have succeeded. They're looking for some kind of conflict resolution. They're oftentimes looking for happily ever after marriage in their perspective. They're looking for some kind of success or hero versus villain. And these are very common tropes. We know this. This is very common in script writing, in books and in movies. The reality is in Islam, when you talk about human experiences and you talk about the purpose of life and you talk about what it means to have a good ending, what does it mean to have a good ending? You find that in conclusion, in short, a good ending in Islam is not always about worldly or material success. Again, a good ending in Islam is not always about a worldly or material success. How do we know this? We know this throughout the Quran, the emphasis on the, the purpose of life and what it means to leave this world in a good state. But of course, let's talk about lived reality. Look at the companions of the Prophet wasallam. It is true that some of them struggled for many years and they succeeded with battle after battle after battle after battle. But let's look at the very first decisive battle in Islamic history, the Battle of Badr. You find that despite the fact that the Muslims, and they were much smaller in number, were given a worldly success, 313 over versus over a thousand of the Qurayshi pagans, they were given a worldly success and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that he sent down the angels to assist them. The battle of Badr was a very decisive one historically. But we also know that some people were martyred. Does that mean those who survived, their ending is good, and those who died as martyrs, as shuhada, their ending was bad? Of course not. Those who left as shuhada are also successful. They're also uh, experiencing a good ending. And the reality is when you look at the different types of shahada, martyrdom in Islam, as we mentioned in previous khutbas before, is of many different types. The highest ranking, the most rewarding, yes, is on the battlefield, like the example of the companions here. But there are over 30 different types of shahada mentioned authentic ahadith. Amongst them, the one who dies in a fire, the mother who dies while giving birth, the one who dies due to drowning, the one who dies due to a stomach cancer, and on and on. There are many examples. The point is that leaving this world, leaving this world on its own does not mean that this was a bad ending. Meaning the ending of life, the cutoff of future ambitions and goals and dreams does not mean this person had a bad ending, not from the Islamic perspective whatsoever. A good ending can be like the example of the man in New York City over 15 years ago. Came, he came to the masjid after Isha prayer had just finished. And his friend told him where to go. He came late. He arrived to the masjid. He's like, I'm ready to become Muslim. There's a sense of urgency. Anyways, they helped him. He embraced Islam. They gave him some materials to start with. And he's like, I will be back for the first prayer tomorrow morning, Fajr prayer. They gave him some of those books that people have when they first become Muslim. And they wanted to teach him salah the very next morning. As they were leaving the masjid, I don't know how far from the masjid, but as one of the mashayikh told us firsthand, that brother who just embraced Islam was hit by a vehicle and he passed away. May Allah have mercy on him. He did not pray a single prayer. But he died with sincerity and humility in his heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the blessing of becoming Muslim and his slate is now clean because this is an act of tawbah from shirk coming to the truth, coming to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know how we'll leave this world. 
We don't know how we will depart from this life. What is a good ending? We have examples of good endings when people are tested with hardships. May Allah alleviate our hardships and our brothers and sisters. But as they are experiencing hardship, they hold on to their faith. There are people who lose their faith in times of hardship. They want to worship Allah only when things are going well in a material sense. They'll worship Allah on their terms. May Allah protect us from any kind of fitna. Allahumma ameen. So the reality is, when you look at the lived human experience and the stories of the Qur'an, and they are almost 23 or 24% of the Qur'an in terms of the number of verses, you find that the people of certain prophets, their ending is mentioned explicitly. Like Prophet Hud alayhi salam, Prophet Salih alayhi salam. Yes, there were some believers, but for the most part, people rejected the clear evidence that this is a prophet of God, the message that he came with. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us how he gave them an opportunity through these prophets and then they were punished. When it was known that none of them, no matter what, they would not believe anymore, they were punished. And their punishment, their ending is detailed in the Quran for a reason. These are lessons for later nations. These are lessons for us. You look at the example of Nuh alayhi salam. Yes, he had a good ending in terms of being saved and the believers who were less than a hundred uh, with him were saved. But his own son chose to flee to a mountain thinking with some pride that I'm going to be safe on this day. I'm going to go to a mountain that will save me from this flood. And Nuh is pleading to his son to ride with us. Ride with us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the waves came in between them. And he became amongst those who drowned with the disbelievers. So when you look at the examples of good endings, you see a really interesting case study of Surah Al-Buruj. Now in the Madani Mus'haf, in the print that is very common, it's one page, this surah, approximately one page. And you have within it references to three different nations, three different people. Amongst them you have a reference to Fir'aun, but specifically, the one I want to talk about is the people of the ditch. These were Muslims. They submitted, they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of a miracle that they saw in the young boy. It's a long story. I think we had a khutbah on this before. They became Muslim and the king told them, he threatened them, if you don't leave this faith, you will all be killed. Whoever refuses to let go of this faith will be killed. And they dug a ditch for them, lit and kindled a large fire, and they were threatened. They held on to their faith and they died. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details their history, their story, their experience in the Qur'an for us to recite until the end of times and to learn from. You would look at a story like this and say they were killed. Is this a bad ending? No, they were all shuhada. They're all martyrs. So sometimes we need to take a step back and redefine what it means to have a good ending. The longest and most detailed single story in one sequence in the Qur'an, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Pretty much most people know the story. Yusuf alayhi salam's story is detailed in the entire Quran once. And it is in Surah Yusuf. His actual story is found only once. And it is in Surah Yusuf. You find that what looks to be a happy ending, that he succeeded, the dream came true, he was given a position as a minister, his family came, they, the brothers admitted, confessed what they did to him, that they tried to hurt him, harm him, kill him. When you look at the ending of the story, some people say, well, this is a happy ending. This is an example that's rare in the Qur'an. A happy worldly ending. But if you take a step back and you look at the rest of the story, you see what? Before that ending, you find that Prophet Yusuf salam suffered a lot. Struggled so much. His own brothers, your own family, throwing him into the well. The hardships he went through in the palace of the minister, being accused of certain things being thrown behind bars and he was innocent. Prophet Yusuf salam went through many struggles and hardships before what we see as a worldly success or worldly victory. And at the end of the day, the point of all of this is to say, happy material endings are not the goal in Islam. We seek comfort at times. But comfort is not guaranteed in this life. May Allah protect us. May Allah make us grateful for all the comforts that we have. May Allah alleviate the affairs of those who are suffering and struggling around the world. We find that a happy material success is not the goal in Islam. And in fact, there isn't a concept in Islam of the pursuit of happiness in the sense of materialism. There's a pursuit of contentment, tranquility in the heart. And a person can be content with very little, and a person can have a lot and be very miserable and empty inside, looking for more and more and more. 
We see in the Quran, we see in the Sunnah, we see in the books of history an emphasis on where you came from and where you're headed. Who are you at the end of the day? And so I want to just mention these three quick reminders. When it comes to where we came from and where we're headed, number one, if you want to have some humility in a moment in which there's some pride, if you ever felt any kind of pride whatsoever, may Allah protect us, think about where biologically you came from. Think about the reality that we come from nothing. We come from things that we don't like to talk about. And the soul was given to us as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are souls with vehicles, with bodies intertwined. And this will bring some humility. If you want to have more humility, think about death and where your body is headed and where your soul is headed. Think about the reality that the body will deteriorate. And this will bring some humility. However, in between birth and death, these two reminders of humility is the test of the state of the heart is the test that you will not become an arrogant person because you have a job, because you think you're better than others, because you have a certain home, you live in a certain city, because of your ethnicity, your language, doesn't really matter. There is no reason or permission or excuse or room in Islam to ever think you are better than other people. To look down on other people, the Prophet ﷺ defined this as kibir, as arrogance. And the second part of arrogance is to reject the truth when it comes to you. That when it comes to you, you accept this is true, I must change. And the reality is oftentimes we don't accept the truth when it comes to us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and forgive us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Dahr or Surah Al-Insan, a reminder about time or humanity, the two nicknames for this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that there was a period of time in which we were not even mentioned. We were not mentioned. We did not exist. You did not walk on this earth. So if Allah blesses you with a job, if Allah blesses you with any kind of privilege or test of this life, and you know that others don't have this test or this privilege or this blessing, don't ever look down on others. For as quickly as it came to you, and as you quickly came into this world, it can leave you as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility. There's a young brother that asked me recently, what are some signs that our ending in life is a good ending? That when you leave this world, you left in a good state. Generally speaking, most of us know that, yes, towards the end of one's life, if you're being righteous, you're taking care of your prayers, your character is good, you're not committing sins, you say the shahada at least once towards the end of your life or as the last statement, you know that these are good signs. In addition, some of the scholars say is dying as a shaheed. We mentioned there are many different types of shahada. Another is the janazah prayer itself, that it was uh, decreed for this person to have a janazah prayer and for at least 40, 50, 60, 100 people to come and pray. There's a specific hadith that mentions those who die and 40 people pray janazah upon them, they will be forgiven uh, in that state, meaning the one who died will be forgiven. Another thing that is mentioned is that oftentimes when those who pass away and they are righteous, they are being washed or they're being buried, that sometimes people are smelling something good coming from them, something that they cannot uh, fully describe. And there are other examples as well, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to their taqwa, their righteousness, their consistency. What did they do in their last moments, their last days? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, wa radiyallahu an, is considered by some scholars because of how righteous he was, and he was a descendant of Umar ibn Khattab. He was considered to be like the fifth of the, the, the rightly guided khulafa. And Umar bin Abdul Aziz, Rahimahullah, he, within two years of being the Khalifa, he changed so many things, reformed so many policies, and in fact, there were so many injustices during the Umayyad dynasty that he uh, repealed, that he changed. At the end of his life, he was in a way poisoned and slowly was uh, dying. At the end of his life, on his deathbed, his wife, who reports this story, his wife Fatima, Rahimahullah, and her brother, they were both there. And they reported, and this is found in a number of books of biography, that at one point at the end of his life, he said, leave, leave the room completely. And in one report, he says, welcome to these faces that I see, faces that are neither the faces of humans nor jinn, meaning it's as though he was seeing something else and Allah knows best. But then in particular, in the narrations that we find, is that he kept repeating one specific ayah. He kept going back to this one verse. In one of the narrations, said he would repeat it. In another, it said he mentioned it. What is this verse that he says as he passes away? Tilka darul akhiratu naj'aluha lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wala fasada wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. That eternal home in the hereafter 
we reserve, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reserves for those who are not looking for tyranny or corruption in the earth. And the ultimate outcome is only for the righteous, al muttaqin is only for those who have taqwa, God consciousness. He mentioned this ayah, and then they heard silence, meaning he stopped repeating it over and over and over, and eventually he went in to check. And in fact, he had passed away, rahimahullah. What's interesting about this ayah, it's really, really remarkable. If you were just to think deeply about it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is linking arrogance, pride, corruption, tyranny, to all types of crimes in this world. And you'll find that an increase in arrogance amongst humanity or a society or an individual, you'll find an increase in immorality and injustice and abuse. In just one family, you can observe such a thing. That if the head of the household is arrogant or has pride in their hearts, that there will be some immorality, there will be some corruption, there will be some impact of their oppression or their abuse. May Allah protect us and grant us humility. So increased arrogance leads to increased crime in the world. May Allah protect us. And the second is that your position in the next life is proportionate to how much humility you live upon in this life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ The good outcome, the ultimate outcome is for those who have taqwa. Those who are afraid of breaking the laws of Allah. Those who are so mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're not coming close to the, the lines, the boundaries that Allah has revealed. And if they accidentally fall into sin, they immediately go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every time you find yourself perhaps angry or about to react to a situation or oppress someone or insult someone, remember, The good ending is for the believers. Right after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us some good news. مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ خَيْرٌ مِنْهَا Whoever brings on the day of judgment, whoever comes with a good deed, they will be given much more than it. Meaning the good deeds are multiplied. Look at the mercy of Allah. And then, وَمَنْ جَاءَ بِالسَّيِّئَةِ Whoever comes with a sin, فَلَا يُجْزَ الَّذِينَ عَمِلُوا السَّيِّئَاتِ إِلَّا مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ They will not be given except that as a compensation, a punishment, a consequence for what they used to do. Meaning what? The sin is for the sin. It doesn't mean it's a light punishment. But the sin is not going to be multiplied unfairly. Everyone who deals with any kind of purification or punishment in the next life, it's because they actually deserve it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. So once again, as we go about life, as you go about your weekly work, your studies, your education, many of you are, alhamdulillah, starting your university classes again, your internships, as many people are raising their children, as many people are doing different things and trying to figure out the next move in life. Remember the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the believer always has a good ending. The believer always has a good ending so long as they hold on to that taqwa, so long as they hold on to their iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you ever find yourself in a heated argument with a loved one in a bad situation in terms of conflict, don't let it end on a bad note. Don't let a situation leave with some kind of division or conflict or enmity in the hearts. The same way that when you start to your university classes, your high school classes, you should be looking ahead. You should be looking at the end. What do you want to do? Do you want to celebrate or regret? Do you want to pass or do you want to fail? If you want to pass, then focus. Put in the effort that is required of you. And at the end of your day, every single day, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness because we have many shortcomings from morning to night. And of course, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the blessings that he has given us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Ask Allah for forgiveness. He is the off forgiving the ever merciful.